You're listening to NHAR, Getting Real, the New Hampshire Real Estate Podcast. New Hampshire is beautiful. This is like a postcard. Like every five feet I walk, there's I look around, everything could be a postcard. Created by New Hampshire Realtors, featuring New Hampshire Realtors for New Hampshire Realtors. Back to you. Back to who? I don't know. <laughs> it's a podcast, so someone had back to Dave or somebody. In this episode of Getting Real. Legal counsel Matt Johnson on updated open house guidance from NAR. Which is helpful and frankly will go a long way toward answering some of our members' questions about this issue. CEO Bob Quinn and public policy chair Chris Norwood with a government affairs update. It was protecting not only the licensee, but also uh, buyer clients and, and the underlying person who owns the land. Housing Wire lead analyst Logan Motoshami on the myth of the mortgage rate lockdown. Lower rates do not create more inventory, and I'm going to explain why and good neighbor winner Linda Walker on her half century of volunteerism. You have to give back to the community. You can't just take from the community. I didn't think I was gonna hear the word phlebotomist today. (laughs) Uh, But but now I have. From the NHAR studio in downtown Concord, New Hampshire, here's your host, Dave Cummings, and co-host, Joni McIntyre. This is NHAR Getting Real. We have a podcast. Hi, Joni McIntyre. Hey. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. So Joni McIntyre, as most of you probably know, is the 2024 president here at the New Hampshire Association of Realtors. My name is Dave Cummings. I'm the vice president of communications here. I'm super excited, Dave. This is, it seems like it's been a kind of a long time in the making, but it's great to finally be here. I love this studio um, that we've been using all year. So that's great. Bob Quinn and I were talking recently about uh, legacy to the extent that folks you know, and in, in historically look back and there there is something of a legacy probably a, a associated with each president, uh, each executive committee. And we were saying that, you know, you don't seek out a legacy. A legacy kind of finds you. Certainly the settlement um, is the issue of the year. It was signed in March. Uh, changes in New Hampshire in July. Changes nationally in August. How are you adapting? How do you feel like our members are adapting? So I imagined um, August 17th uh, to be just like a disaster of a day. People calling in, didn't know what was happening. Um, The world is falling in. Uh, And then we find out that the change is going to be July 15th. So that was kind of shocking. Um, And the day came and went. And um, I feel like for such an enormous change, people have dealt really well with it. I wanted to ask what your message is to members, and I know it's not just about the, the mechanics of it, but in this month, and I'll, I'll show this, uh, the most recent New Hampshire Realtor magazine, which is right here, the president's message from you is Offers of Empathy is the, is the title of it. I want to just read a little bit and ask you to, to react to it. Uh, so what you wrote was, I understand this new way of doing business is now our reality. And for that very reason, it's never been more important for us to embrace the characteristics that the realtor brand denotes. Education, empathy, integrity, cooperation, and a heartfelt commitment to the spirit and practice of the golden rule. And then you conclude by saying, yes, we are businesses, but we are people first. Of all the offers we handle in our day-to-day business affairs, it is our offers of understanding, kindness, and grace to one another that will see us through. Got to say, got a little goosebumps there. <laughs> so what did you have in mind when you, when you wrote that and said that? So I know that in, in before the settlement, in everyday life, mm-hmm. we all do things differently in our business. Um, we all have different business models. Um, sometimes it makes us angry, um, but... For a smooth transaction, we have to, you know, take a breath and um, understand that. And this big change, a lot of people have a lot of questions that we don't have immediate answers to. We don't, we have Matt, who, Matt Johnson, um, our legal counsel, who has kind of sherped us through this. um, But the answers aren't necessarily always right there. And... So we need to give each other and ourselves some grace and say, all right, you do things a little bit differently than I do things, as we always have. I understand that. And I don't maybe know the answer to that question myself. Um, I'm sure there's somebody who can help me out, legal resource line, um, 
call me directly. I've had a, a number of calls directly, um, and um, they're all good questions. And I just think a little bit of grace all around makes every transaction easier, and in this case, our whole business easier. And I love what you say about, I don't know. Sometimes that's the most powerful thing that you can possibly say, rather than trying to come up with a, an answer that you really aren't 100% sure of, and also the fact that the only right answer is it depends. I mean, sometimes you can't provide that answer in that moment. And I know you do a really nice job in working with the media in that way as well. And you're not one who will jump right on a, conver- on a, on a call with a reporter. You, you take some time, give it some thought. And, uh, and I think that's really a, a great lesson in any communication, really, is to be, yeah. not be afraid to say, I don't know right now. Right, right. Right, because someone does know. So the first person we're going to hear from is our uh, legal counsel, Matt Johnson, who is going to speak to uh, a a slight change in guidance from NAR regarding open houses. So we'll play that now. Uh, NAR released some guidance relative to open houses. That's been a hot button topic. Uh, And that NAR guidance explained that the settlement agreement focuses on two concepts of working with a buyer and then before touring a home. And NAR's guidance is that if you are an agent hosting an open house, you are not working with the buyer. And so you do not need a written buyer agency agreement for uh, buyers to tour property. So that means a couple of things. One, uh, if you're working for the listing agent or helping a listing agent and buyers come into the, to see the open house, they do not need written agreements. You should not be turning people away who don't have written buyer agency agreements from seeing the property. And second, and, and this is a question we've received, received several times, is that even if you are a buyer's agent hosting an open house with the intent of, of getting buyer clients, The NAR guidance says you do not need a written buyer agency agreement before touring that, before hosting that open house or to communicate and talk with those buyers at that open house. The analysis being that you are not already working with the buyers when they come to the open house. So that's a clarification of some of the guidance we've given before now that we have more guidance from NAR in terms of how they are interpreting the settlement agreement. Okay, so Joni, your thoughts. Okay, so the first thing that I would say is don't turn anyone away. Um, you're first in that situation, your client right on that at that minute is your seller. Do not turn buyers away. Next up, we want to talk about some upcoming events, and I will speak to what's happening here at NHAR for the past year. Every month, we've been doing monthly Zoom education, three credits uh, in most cases, and that continues in November and December. In November, Uh, Very relevant buyer agency with Monica McGillicuddy, longtime instructor here, a past president of the state association. Uh, And then December 5th, Realtor Professional Guidelines. That's also with Monica. Uh, So November 7th and December 5th. And you can find any of that at nhar.org forward slash 2024-education. So 2024-education, it's also on our homepage, but you can register for for those. Again, three credit classes. November 7th is buyer agency. December 5th is realtor professional guidelines. Also very exciting in that window is NAR Next. So the the national conference is coming to Boston, which is super exciting. And we um, have some special events that we'll be having since we're so close. So why don't you talk a little bit about that, Joni? Yeah, so that is a great conference. I was there in 2018 for when it was held in Boston last. And it's um, it's it's awesome. Saw a lot of great speakers there. Um, on Saturday the 9th, we'll have dinner, um, New Hampshire Night Out at The View, which is at the top of the Pru. Um, I'm so excited about that. The next morning is the Realtor Relief 5K, so you can walk or run, and all the proceeds of that will go to the Realtor Relief Fund, um, or just count and cheer. It's uh, Dave and I ran it last year, or not, I mean not last year, but 2018, and um, ha- it was a cold rainy day it was we're probably gonna have better weather yeah it's a, that's a guess but there was um there were lots of people cheering us on and so i'm really excited about that um david ortiz will be the closing speaker um the the national association has closed down yaki way i believe so that we can have a um a whole big deal there so it's a really great time and um 
If you haven't looked into it, do. And if you just come for a day, you'll get a lot out of it or come for the whole time. Yeah, and again, November 8th through 10th, that's in the Boston Seaport District. And a couple ways that you can find that to, to register, nhar.org forward slash road to Boston, road hyphen to hyphen Boston, or narnxt.realtor will get you to where you need to get to, to do any of that registration um, and uh, particularly get in on the the night out at the PRU will be really exciting and fun. So, uh, yeah. But the education is is amazing as well. Uh, through the whole through the whole conference, so excited about that. Okay, so now we're gonna we're gonna uh, hear from our CEO and who's our, also our government affairs <coughs> director, uh, Bob Quinn, along with the public policy committee chair Chris Norwood, doing an amazing job down at the state house all year round, really, not just when when we're in session. So uh, what we're about to hear is uh, a segment that they a, a conversation between the two of them regarding uh, licensing requirements and also uh, land scams and the ability to have uh, a means of identifying folks uh, with, with driver's licenses. So let's take a little listen and then we can react to that. Senate Bill 480, and this one specifically has to do with an issue rel relative to real estate licensing and what is oftentimes referred to as post-licensing, right? Yeah, and so our members may remember that a number of years ago it was passed that the first two years that you obtain your real estate license, you had specific courses that you needed to take. Um, there have been some confusion surrounding the merger of the Real Estate Commission and OPLC. So what this bill would do, it would put back on the books and clarify those courses. And so for those of you who are curious or, you know, inviting uh, a, a non-licensee to get their license, the four uh, courses that new licensees will have to take are uh, purchase and sales agreement, ethics, disclosures, and agency. Um, and so that, that had been on the books, but again, it kind of had fallen by the wayside over the past couple of years. Yep. And so um, this year, uh, the legislature did pass a bill which is going to bring forward in post-licensing uh, back again. And we're talking with the uh, Office of Professional Licensing uh, um, to try to determine how that's going to be implemented uh, in 2025. But uh, folks should be at least aware of it, especially if you're getting your, a new license. Yep. Another bill that we were heavily involved in, uh, in fact, uh, introduced at the legislature was Senate Bill 502, um, which you know, many folks may be surprised to learn that... Um, you are, we were surprised, we didn't know this <laughs> as well, um, that if you do ask somebody to, you're trying to identify who may be calling you or communicating with you, you ask them to send you your, them their driver's license um, electronically, that is in fact prohibited by state law, right Chris? Yeah, and so uh, what was happening is you would get a circumstance like this. You'd get um, a phone call that would say, hey, I'm Johnny Jones, uh, my grandmother just passed away and they left me some land in their will. Uh, Bob, would you list it? And Bob, of course, being an opportunist realtor would say, yeah, let, let me dig up some information and so forth. Well, what was happening is Johnny Jones was calling Bob under false pretenses and really it was, it was land fraud or, or title deed fraud, whatever you want to call it. Uh, in, in order to protect ourselves as realtors, we wanted to uh, take a photocopy of Bob's license or have him send uh, me, or sorry, not Bob, Johnny Jones. Bob, I'm not saying you <laughs> nice. did this. It wasn't you, this uh, this fraudster, Johnny Jones. Um, but, but as Bob said, it was illegal. The only institutions in our state that are allowed to take photocopies of license are financial institutions or, or oddly enough, pawn shops were allowed to do it. So now realtors are in the same status of pawn shops. I'm happy to notify everyone. Yeah. It was interesting little twist is New Hampshire, um, you were prohibited from accepting a New Hampshire driver's license. But if someone was from Massachusetts or Delaware, you actually could accept that license. It was only specific to New Hampshire driver's licenses. Yeah, we really felt it was uh, it was protecting not only the licensee, but also uh, buyer clients and, and the underlying person who owns the land. Uh, and uh, I think that the legislature and the Department of Safety saw the similar path. And so this bill 502 is now law. Um, and so I, I would urge you to read up on the law before you go asking everyone for their license. But it is something that's important. And unfortunately, this type of fraud was taking place. Great. 
Well, thanks for the update, Chris. And uh, we look forward to seeing you uh, next time. In the long form version of this conversation, they discuss a couple other things, two bills to help alleviate the inventory crisis and also uh, a couple of notifications on the PNS. I think one is PFAS and the other one is flood. flood. Okay, right. so uh, that's what we can that's what we can look forward to in that longer interview if, you, if you're interested. Um, but Joni, I, I know that you speak to this a lot about just the importance of public policy in general. And I think it's one of the, the things that uh, folks who aren't necessarily around the, the association would necessarily know. It's the, it's the work that gets done at the state house that is so fundamental to the industry and helping folks do their business. So just share a little bit of your insight into, into, into that. Advocacy is really the important part of our association. Um, we advocate for private property rights, sometimes for ourselves, but for the most part, it's private property rights. And unlike our other benefits that we offer um, through the association, there's no dollar figure that we can um, assign to our advocacy, but it is huge. Um, and the just the uh, the volunteer hours that go into it um, at the state house in our public policy meetings um, that that's phenomenal. When I started on public policy, which was a few years ago, it helped me learn more about the industry than I ever ever thought I could learn. Um, you know, we do buy and sell or bring buyers and sellers together for a fee, as I was taught. Um, but there's so much more that goes into um, the, Na the New Hampshire Association than, than to that piece. Yeah, and I think what's also interesting to note and uh, important, and I think w uh, something that newcomers to the, to the committee or to the association quickly realize is when Bob Quinn speaks or when uh, Sarah Holland or Chris Norwood speak, they, the, it, legislators listen. Right, and that's um, across the aisle, both sides mm -hmm. of the aisle. Um, one thing that I did hear at a, a public policy retreat, I think, um, was if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And I think that's a really good way of looking at that advocacy. Um, we're advocating for our property owners and, in, like I said, in some cases for our members. Um, and if we're not there, we can't do that for them. Right. Finally, we spoke to Logan Motoshami, who was uh, one of the speakers at our education symposium this year. He is the uh, lead analyst at Housing Wire. Housing Wire is a benefit of ours, of our members. We all have access to Housing Wire and to Logan's um, conversations about the market. And uh, let's take a listen to that now. 70% of all mortgages at or below 4%. 90% at or below 5%. Uh, that seems like a real formula for some stagnation. Is it, in fact? And what does the, what has to happen to move so the needle? So it, it's, it's interesting. I don't believe in the mortgage rate lockdown for a, for a different reason. Um, for about two years, we every single week, we've had people sell their low mortgage rates. We could see it in the coupon data and buy a house. Affordability after the 2010 qualified mortgage rule people have to actually qualify to buy a home now. So the affordability issue is preventing uh, 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 people from listing their houses and selling them and buying another one. And that's prices and taxes and insurance and everything. So it, it's, it's the whole enchilada in housing. So if we, if we had a gold, an authentic golden handcuff, uh, we'd probably be 2 million sales less today. Uh, uh, but every single week, there are people, it, it seems crazy to people to like sell their two to three to 4% mortgages, but most sellers are buyers. People have to move. Uh, um, there's about 20 to 30% of sellers who don't, who sell their homes or, and don't buy another one, whether there was an investment or a death in the family or so, something to that nature. But uh, when wages grow and mortgage rates go down, we could get more sellers that will be buyers because the affordability gets better. But home prices escalated out of control faster than during the housing bubble years. That's more of a total active listings got to record lows at the worst time ever, mm -hmm. uh, which has been a concern of mine for well over 10 years that this period, years 2020 to 2024, is like the golden period of housing. Like uh, ages 28 to 35 are the biggest in U.S. history. First time home buyers, many majors, like 33 to 35. So you're going to get a little bit kick of better demand. And those kids don't provide you a house. They're pesky little kids, mm, you know. That's true. Uh, uh, so that's, that's part of the problem. And we finally paid the price 
for not having enough product available and home prices escalate out of control. So lower ma- lower mortgage rates will bring the affordability uh, uh, d- uh, better, and then that'll bring more sellers that are buyers. That'll bring more first-time home buyers. Uh, but we've had people sell their homes with low mortgage rates. If the, if the golden handcuff were authentically true, or well, it'd be really bad. I mean, sales would even plummet even from these record low levels. So you mentioned affordability, um, and I'm sure that every place tracks affordability a little bit differently. Here in New Hampshire, um, we have an affordability index, and basically it's at 58 right now. That number is at 58, and I'll explain what, how we measure that. And it's based on the median household income compared to what's necessary to qualify for the median price home. So 58 means that the median household income is only 58% of what's necessary to qualify for, for the uh, median price home under the prevailing interest rates. So I guess I just would ask you, I don't even know if there's a question in there other than to say, how does that number strike you? It's the lowest that we've seen since we've been tracking this for 20 years. So there's one other time where affordability was worse. It was the early 1980s uh, when we had uh, double digit mortgage rates. And uh, a lot of people don't remember this, but in the early 1980s, uh, even the run-up in this in the late 70s, home prices were booming in the 70s. Uh, and when home sales crashed in the early 1980s, we had worse affordability. We had a recession. We had more inventory, less workers. Home prices didn't even fall back then. Uh, but affordability was uh, slightly worse. So that's the only period of time that I can refer uh, on, on the data lines. But even then... When mortgage rates fell 2.5%, sales took off. And that's what we see uh, uh, in the data. There's going to be a, a nice chart in the presentation tomorrow that shows what exactly happened. There's a lot of similarities between the 1980s and currently right now with the baby boomers back then. They were playing the millennial role. Uh, sales are at such low levels. But when we think about median incomes, we have to remember that um, – the NAR uses this data line. They say uh, an, an average household has to make 110000 to buy a home in America. Well, what does America have that a lot of countries don't have? They, we have a lot of dual household incomes. So if somebody makes 90000 and somebody makes seventy, that's how you get 5 million total home sales. Like people ask me, they're like, well, who are buying these homes? Like our peak total home sales in the last decade was around $6 million. So now we're at five million with the biggest affordability hit. So home buyers in America, think about we are a country of 336 million, 162 million people working. A lot of dual household incomes can afford homes, and that's how you get that near five million. Rates going lower makes the pool bigger, and uh, credit is available out there. We don't have a we don't have a credit issue. That's how you grow sales is by lower mortgage rates. Every economic cycle we've had since 1981 is at 2% plus lower mortgage rates. That's helped boost demand. And uh, uh, if we've had a higher end range of 6 to 8%, if we get a 4 to 6% rate range, we grow sales. How do I know this? Because the builders have been doing this for the last two years. They've been working in a sub 6% mortgage market and their sales have grown since the lows of 2022. The existing home sales market has been disproportionately hit by Fed policy, so uh, uh, that's kept sales at record low levels. But if mortgage rates fall, history tells us that'll grow sales, especially considering how low we are currently right now and uh, how the size of our workforce and our demographics. So one of the things that we struggle with sometimes at the state house is this idea that, hey, the interest rates are going to fall, the mortgage rates are going to fall, the market's going to take care of itself. Meanwhile, you know, we're really pushing back on the inventory question. And the New Hampshire Housing Finance Authority did a statewide needs assessment. And what they determined was that New Hampshire needs nearly 24,000 additional housing units to, to stabilize the market. And by 2040, we'll need an additional 90,000. What's the push and pull of, of the uh, interest rates, mortgage rates, and inventory? Okay, this has been a big part of my work for 14 years. Lower rates do not create more inventory, and I'm going to explain why. After 2010, we had a law called qualified mortgage come in. That means uh, everybody uh, uh, has to basically be approved for a home purchase when they list their house and sell. So if 70 to 80 percent of sellers are buyers, that inventory is kind of a wash. You got 20 to 30 percent left. Again, what is one group of people that do not provide you a house? 
Millennials, those pesky kids have been buying the homes with mortgages uh, and uh, they started buying in 2013. So when you look at the inventory data, it's been slowly moving lower and lower and lower. And the only time inventory actually ever grows is with higher rates and weakness in demand because it takes longer to sell. So you have to build, you have to build baby build because the homeowner's vacancy rate is 0.9% nationally. Uh, uh, and uh, your people, uh, unless we have a, a swath of people just leaving Earth and leaving their homes behind, uh, it doesn't. Nothing, nothing in, impacts inflation better than supply, right? More supply when you build that house, it's there forever, or not forever, for a very long time. So uh, we have to become a country that builds. And when rates go lower, what's going to happen is. That seller sells their house, buys another one, that inventory is a wash, and then the first time home buyers come in and they take what's left. And that's been the problem. Uh, active inventory has been falling for kind of 14 years and the only time we ever see inventory growth is with higher rates, not with lower rates. So it's, it's, a, it's a unique way to look at housing economics, but I believe it's the correct way. So if you want more housing, build, 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 because that supply doesn't go away uh, out there. Great. That's exactly the message we're trying to yeah. convey to at the state house because we do we have re restrictive zoning policies in the state. Maybe it's everywhere, but certainly in the state. So we're trying to push back against that. So that's that's the perfect message for that. Yeah, that's uh, uh, I, I tour the country and I tell people if you think lower rates are here's the chart. Look at this. Oh, it's never worked for the last 14 years. So, uh, uh, you know, we just the previous decade, we 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 had the worst housing construction growth in history and eventually caught up to us. We have millennials. They were here all the time. Avocado toast didn't break them, you know, so they bought homes. They live in them for a long time. And, and also, you know, uh, from 1985 to 2007, people lived in their homes five to seven years. From 2008 to 2024, that's gone up to 11 to 13 years. Parts of the country, it's 15 to 18 years. I've lived in my home for 20 years. So we're just living in our homes longer and longer. And if you don't build something, you know, the population is growing. It's not like we're, we're not Japan where 40% of our population will be dead by the end of the century. So we have a growing population still. We have a lot of people that are young households that need housing. And we just got caught in a very, very bad spot. And the best way to deal with inflation is supply and you build it. So, Joni, I know you've been listening to Logan for a while. I know you're, you're a big supporter of housing. Why you, you um, get a lot of information from that? What did you think about his appearance and, and him being here and uh, his comments? So, I w like I said in the beginning, I was so excited that he was going to be here. Housing Wire said when we um, signed on with them, hey, you can have some of our personalities um, for the day or, or whatever you need for your, for your podcast. Um, that was really exciting. He is a really smart guy. Like some of the stuff I have to re-listen to when I listen to him on a podcast. Um, but there's some really great information that you can pull from what he um, what he talks about that makes you seem like the smartest person in the room. Um, one of the things he, he stresses is um, labor over inflation, that the Fed's really looking at the labor numbers. Now, this is his opinion. Um, and that's why they didn't start lowering the rates until now. Um, another interesting thing that uh, I've been saying for a couple months, especially to reporters, is the rates have come down since 2022 with no Fed rate, no Fed cuts. So um, we seem to be sort of hyper focused on what the Fed is doing and not really pay, paying attention to what's actually happening. Um, and uh, so those are some of the things that I've heard that he, that I've heard him say that have helped me with my business. Like I can remind people about that. Um, and uh, I think he's the smartest guy in the room when he's there. Um, so you get a little bit from that and you feel like the smartest person in the room. Yeah, and, and so as I mentioned, Housing Wire is a, is a member benefit. And uh, if you go on the homepage at nhar.org and scroll down and you haven't already, look for Housing Wire. There's a, a very convenient place to sign up there where you will get all of Logan's insights and all of the Housing Wire insights. Uh, just a really a great repository of uh, housing information um, stories that's very balanced as well. I think that's important. Oh, yeah. I think it's it's really good 
just plain information. So we'll shift gears again to our NHAR good neighbor. Uh, this year's winner was Linda Walker, is Linda Walker. She is a realtor up in the North Conway area, the Mount Washington Valley, and just an amazing story. So we're going to just listen to a little bit of the interview that I had with uh, Linda Walker here. Well, I absolutely love the NHAR Good Neighbor Award. Uh, it was introduced in 2003. It's been over 20 years now that it's been in existence, and it's for a realtor who makes exceptional contributions to their communities through volunteerism. And I just, I love that idea because it's not so much about the business. It's not necessarily about how many homes you've sold. It's just about making the world a better place around you. So each year uh, we uh, we honor someone with that title. Uh, the winner each year gets a cash contribution for their organization and the title of the New Hampshire Association of Realtors Good Neighbor. This year's pool of applicants, it was a strong one as it usually is. But it included one woman who really stood out. Uh, she started a foundation in 1973, along with a few friends called the Christmas Stocking Project in the Mount Washington Valley of New Hampshire. And it's still going strong today. So that math means that this is, I believe, the 52nd year over 2000 kids have had a better Christmas because of this organization and this woman. So very happy to say hello to Linda Walker. Hi, Linda. Hi. So I won't I won't steal any more of the thunder in terms of talking about the organization, but I do want to just start out by asking what was the original inspiration uh, back in 1973 and how did it come to be? Okay, so I belong to a church in North Conway, uh, where I am, and uh, they had this program uh, that were three, actually three older women. Um, now I'm in that category, but back then I wasn't. And um, they they did something through the church, and they wanted to give it up. They were they wanted to retire from it. So I said that I would take it over because I I knew about it. And they they named it Christmas Stocking Project because they would make stockings out of red towels with a white washcloth around the you know to make it look like a stocking and they would fill it with gently used things items for children mostly in our church um that's how it all started when i took it over we got um we got incorporated with what was called uh children and youth um the uh company not company Ministry? <laughs> program, program. Um, and we got in, involved. And so we started then getting names from <clears throat> that organization, which weren't just from that church, but they were needy children in the greater area. Um, I then had, um, so I got three of my friends to help me out. And Along the way, uh, and we changed it in that we we now have only new things, and we've made it much more than just a stocking. Um, each each child gets um, at least six things from their sponsor, three things that they need, three things that they want, and then Christmas Stocking Project gives them a pair of pajamas, a book and at least another toy but most of the most of the sponsors don't just stick to those six things either um you know it, it so they get a huge christmas usually it's at least one big garbage bag full of things um and and most often more than that so it started out in a kind of a different way and it's it's morphed into something different and along the way, I can't emphasize this enough that I've had so much help along the way. None of those three originals are still with me because one of them moved, I mean, for various reasons, but other people have come so that I usually have three other people uh, helping me out with the sponsors. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's, it's a village. It's not just me. I just happen to be the consistent one all these years and um, trying to get some younger people involved so that it keeps going. 
Yeah, it's really amazing. And like I said, uh, the the committee that decides this was completely it was it was one of the easier decisions, even though, again, we had a very strong uh, pool of applicants this year. Um, so this uh, I'm doing more math. And 52 years ago, I believe you would have been around 20. You're in your late 20s mm -hmm. in 1973 when this began. Would you have imagined that it would be sustained for this long and then it would grow to this much. And my guess is that your your thoughts at that point at that time were probably a little more modest. Yes, I, I didn't I wasn't thinking long range. When you're that age, you're not thinking so long range. I had um I had one child at that point was pregnant with another and then ended up with a third. So uh, you know it's um but I I didn't ever think I don't think of the longevity of it, but I'm thrilled that it, that I've, I've been able to keep it alive and hopefully whoever I pass it along to will will do the same. What do you see as the future of the Christmas stocking project? What what do you have in in mind? Just keep on keep on doing your thing? I'm going to do I'm going to keep doing it till I can't do it. I can still actually even if somebody else if I got somebody else to do the shopping, I could still even get find the sponsors. So, um, I, as I said, I'm trying to get younger people involved so that when I can't do it, they still will. That's my goal. A public school teacher for 28 years. I mean, she's just amazing and still going strong. So, uh, this is a 52 year old organization that she founded back in, I believe, 1973. This is in, we're in its 52nd year. Every year she has donated the books to, uh, mm -hmm. to the, to the kids and has been, she's the, the lone original founder who's, who's still involved. So volunteerism, as she spoke to, is so important. I love the Good Neighbor Award. Um, at the Sunapee Board of Realtors, we just started a Good Neighbor Award um, maybe two or three years ago. I know that so many of our members are volunteers, um, and they don't even think about w what they do as something that is extra. Like, they just do it because... You know, it gets them out there. They feel good about it. As as all volunteer work that you do, you get more out of it than you put in, I'm sure people would say. An another thing that I do want to mention is we're really looking for input. So if things worked, if things didn't work, if you found things of use, things not of use, uh, please let us know. Uh, um, I can be reached at dave at nhar.com. Again, Dave at NHR.com. My mobile phone number is on most of the information that we that we send out. So feel free to contact me with ideas or with criticisms. You know, we we love to hear that we're doing great. That makes us feel good. But the things that we're not doing well that makes us get better. So uh, that's what we're that's what we're looking for. Any conversations that we can have with you, our members, to uh, to just make this better and, and help to make your business better as well. That's what we're here for. So thank you, Joni. Thank you. NHAR.org forward slash getting real. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Thank you. NHAR Getting Real, created by New Hampshire Realtors, featuring New Hampshire Realtors for New Hampshire Realtors. It's NHAR Getting Real. NHAR Getting Real, created by New Hampshire Realtors, featuring New Hampshire Realtors for New Hampshire Realtors. Created by New Hampshire Realtors, featuring New Hampshire Realtors for New Hampshire Realtors. It's NHAR Getting Real. In this episode of Getting Real, NHAR Getting Real, created by New Hampshire Realtors, featuring New Hampshire Realtors for New Hampshire Realtors. Created by New Hampshire Realtors, Featuring New Hampshire Realtors for New Hampshire Realtors. It's NHAR Getting Real. In this episode of Getting Real,